continuing. Uh, so it's 4 p.m., our first day of, of Vita Foods Europe, um, and welcome everyone back to our wonderful live event. Um, I'm Fran Schoenwetter. I'm with Informa and with Natural Products Insider out of the U.S., supporting this content today. And uh, we have, for our final presentation, more on healthy aging. We're all interested in healthy aging, and we know that our customers um, are looking for various approaches. And again, we're going to dig into vitamin K2, menaquone 7, and the research on cardiovascular health. And uh, this will be brought to you by uh, Gnosis, by Lasoff. And uh, before we uh, dig into the science uh, with our key speaker, Professor Leon Sugars, he's the professor of biochemistry of vascular calcification and vice chair of biochemistry gnosis by Lasoff. Before we dig into the science, I'd like to just welcome to the stage Anna Rooksvog. Anna is the marketing manager for vitamin K2 for gnosis and Lasoff. And she'll just be speaking a little bit about the K2 market today before we hand things back over to Dr. Sugars. Anna? Thank you so much, Fran, and hello, welcome everyone. Before I let Professor Leon Sugars onto the stage, I would like to give you a quick update on where the vitamin K2 market is today. So we're really happy to see that vitamin K2 is hitting critical mass, and it is taking its place among dietary supplements that are best supported by clinical evidence. When we look at new product launches featuring vitamin K2, we observe a solid growth with a plus 30% uh, each year of new product launches featuring vitamin K2 since 2015. What is important to understand that this growth and the, the status and the growth of the uh, vitamin K2 market today is driven by the clinical validation that is done for vitamin K2 as MK7 for bone and cardiovascular health. And this research is solely based on the brand MeniQ7 that is uh, provided by Gnosis by Lesaf. So without further ado, and here to speak on the stage on how cardiovascular health and healthy aging is interlinked and how vitamin K2 can inhibit calcification and oxidative stress and also promote ATP production. So please help me welcome Professor Leon Schurgers from Maastricht University. Thank you, Annie. You for don't the, need that. No. Thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for, for Gnosis by Lissar for inviting me. Thank you for the organizers to give me the opportunity to speak here today because normally I speak at medical conventions, which is a completely different topic. So I try to guide you through what I think um, is important in, in relation to vitamin K2 research, healthy aging. So my name is Leon, as introduced. I'm working as a biochemist at the biochemistry department in Maastricht University in the very south of the Netherlands. And there I work at the Cardiovascular Research Institute. And I'm doing and performing my research on vitamin K, vascular smooth muscle cell, vascular remodeling, and vascular aging. So before I start with my life into vitamin K, I want to give you a brief update of what is vitamin K. Actually, vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. It was discovered 80 years ago by the Danish researcher Hendrik Dam, and he was doing so by feeding chickens a fat-free diet. And he was interested in, in fat components in this, in this diet and how this would be of value for, 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 let's say, healthy aging. And all these chickens were bleeding to death. And then he isolated one micronutrient, which, beca which became vitamin K. And actually, because it was published in a German journal, coagulation, written with a K, it became vitamin K. Now, this vitamin K stands for coagulation, and you can argue with me, because I believe it stands also for calcification. There are today 14 vitamin K-dependent proteins known, most of them in the coagulation system. So we have factors 2, 
7, 9, and 10, proteins S, C, and Z. But then we discovered also proteins that are vitamin K dependent, completely rely on vitamin K for their function, and we isolated them from bone or vasculature or cartilage. So also their vitamin K has a very important role. Vitamin K is very well known as its role as a cofactor for the carboxylation, the activation of so-called vitamin K-dependent proteins. And we know two natural flavors, vitamin K1, phylloquinone, or vitamin K2, also known as the group of menaquinones. And actually, Hendrik Dam and Doisy, the American counterpart of Hendrik Dam, they received the Nobel Prize for their work on vitamin K. And today we have a recommended daily intake given uh, to us that is one microgram of vitamin K per kilogram of body weight per day. So that means around 90 micrograms of vitamin K per day would be sufficient. And you can argue about that, especially if we grow older. So where does my story start, so my life of vitamin K? So I started in 1998 as a PhD student in the Maastricht University, and I got the topic of vascular disease and vitamin K-dependent proteins. And I was the first one that, if you read the title of my thesis, which I defended uh, in public successfully in 2002, um, it is on the studies on the role of vitamin K1 and K2 in bone metabolism and cardiovascular disease. And that was actually the start where people started to look into the differences between K1 and K2. And if you look closely at the cover of my thesis, you can see different organs of the body. And that always already depicted that we believe that vitamin K has a broad range of health effects in our body. And actually, together with my dear colleague Martin Shearer from, uh, from uh, St. Thomas Hospital in, in the UK, and he was actually the founder of vitamin K analysis using HPLC and fluorescence detection, we wrote a nice book chapter. And actually, it states, and I cannot say it better than he phrased it, a vitamin once regarded as the Cinderella of fat-soluble vitamins emerged from a single function hemo hemeostasis vitamin to a multifunction vitamin and arguably the most fascinating of all, which is vitamin K. So I think this is stating it all and actually I could not say it better. Now, like I mentioned, you have two flavors of natural occurring vitamin Ks, K1, K2, and we have a synthetic form of vitamin K which is termed menadion. Menadion is only the naphthoquinone ring structure which we give to, to uh, cattle feed or chicken feed to prevent them to have broken bones. But then we have phylloquinone, also known as K1, and we have the menaquinones, uh, also known as vitamin K2. We see that K1 is mainly present in green leafy vegetables. K2 is of fermented origins. With other words, bacteria produce menaquinone. So we find it in, for example, fermented food, in fermented cheese, in sauerkraut, and, for example, a very popular Japanese dish, which is called natto. Now, and we believe that vitamin K has some superpower because it really activates these vitamin K-dependent proteins. So in terms of vitamin K1, uh, vitamin K2, we have this so-called French paradox. And we believe that it is not only the wine that is so beneficial, it's also the cheese. So when did the story start? So we wanted to compare K1 versus K2. Both are equally effective as a cofactor in the carboxylation and the activation of so-called vitamin K-dependent proteins. What we did is we gave a single meal to 12 volunteers in the morning, consisting of 100 gram of natto, which is one milligram of MK7, and 400 grams of spinach, which is equivalent to one milligram of vitamin K1. We put it all together, we stirred it. I think my wife was screaming from upstairs, it smells like hell, but I had to eat it. I was one of the volunteers. So when eating it, after that, we took blood. Blood at baseline, one hour, two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours, 24 hours after ingestion. And then we could measure the absorption of vitamin K1 from the spinach and vitamin MK7 from the natto. And what you can see here is that the MK7 has a way better absorption than K1. K1 is known to bound to the chloroplast membrane. 
in the green leafy vegetables. So about 80 to 90% of that vitamin K1 ends up in the toilet, and only 10 to 20% is absorbed. Of the MK7 produced by the bacteria in the natto, almost everything is absorbed. So the absorption is way more complete, so you get way more with a lower intake. But what is more striking is this second part, which is the half-life. And that has to do with the lipophilicity of the vitamins. Vitamin K1 is absorbed, but then readily taken up by the liver, stays in the liver. MK7 is taken up by the liver, but then redistributed via VLDL, LDL, setting free back in the circulation, available for other tissues as well. Now, how do we take this concept? We believe that vitamin K1, 90% of our intake is K1, based on what we see from food, food uh, measurements. However, once we absorb it, most of the K1 is not being absorbed, ending in the toilet. So if you look at the vitamin K absorbed, then we think that only 50% of K1 versus 50% of the main aquinones is getting into our body. Body, even if we have lower um, concentrations in the food, but because it is better absorbed, it contributes more. And if you then look at x ray hepatic bioactivity, then we believe that MK7, 8, and 9 contributes most to this x ray hepatic um, activity because of the long half life. So I think, based on this, we need to reconsider recommended daily intakes and not only base them on K1. So how convince the community that vitamin K plays a key role in healthy aging? It's a very difficult one. So it is coagulation versus calcification, both written with a K in German. Vitamin K-dependent proteins, also termed as GLA proteins, because you convert a glutamate amino acid into a so-called GLA amino acid. We need vitamin K for proper coagulation and anticoagulation. So vitamin K is really important. Without vitamin K, we would all be bleeding to death. We have vitamin K for bone, because in bone there is this protein called osteocalcin. Osteo from bone, calcin from attracting calcium to the right place. Osteocalcin also is a vitamin K-dependent protein. And finally, we have matrix GLA protein produced by vascular smooth muscle cells and chondrocytes, and the strongest inhibitor of ectopic mineralization. Again, MGP is a vitamin K-dependent protein. So the function of MGP became clear when researchers made a MGP knockout mouse. MGP was purified from bone, Everybody was believing MGP is a bone protein. It facilitates proper bone building. It has a role in strong bone building. Then these researchers made a MGP knockout mouse. And what you do is you take the DNA of that mouse, cut out the gene that codes for this protein, put back the DNA, and you create a mouse that produces everything except this protein. And then you can study the function of this protein. Well, what you can see is that from the MGP minus minus, this is the knockout mouse, you see that there is an extra spine where the arrow is pointing to. This is not an extra spine, this is the aorta, the big arterial vessel in our body, completely calcified. Below it, in black, you see these nice black lines. This is elastic lamina in your vessel wall that normally supports vascular tone, completely mineralized. So within eight weeks after birth, these mice all died because vessels became bone. So MGP, one of the strongest inhibitors of vascular calcification. Now, you can argue with me, is vascular calcification important? And I tell you this because when I started my research 20 years ago, I went to the Department of Pathology, talking to the former head of our Cardiovascular Research Institute, and I said, I want to have specimens from elderly people because I'm interested in vascular calcification. And this pathologist said to me, Leon, why are you working on this? It's a passive process. It's always there. It's a bystander of disease. It's not relevant. It's not clinical relevant. But stubborn as I was, and still am, we wanted to investigate vascular calcification as a risk marker for cardiovascular disease. 
Now, with a former PhD student of mine who is now working in the vascular internal medicine department in our hospital in Maastricht, we did a meta-analysis. And we screened all the literature of studies that reported calcification at any vascular site with any vascular uh, side effect or vascular event. Now, what you can see is that there is a 3.4-fold increase on getting cardiovascular events if calcification is present in your body at any vascular site, being it the carotids, coronary, aorta, peripheral arteries, medial, intimal, it doesn't matter. If calcification is present in your vessels, you have a 3.5-fold increased risk on a cardiovascular event. Better prevent vascular calcification, I would say. If you look at the dialysis population, where you have even more calcification because there is this uremic toxin pressure and these, these patients really suffer from vascular calcification, you can see from these studies that there is a fourfold increase of dying, cardiovascular disease-related dying, if calcification is present in your vessels better prevent vascular calcification because it will increase the risk of dying from a cardiovascular event. This is not only our research, this is now also accepted by the complete scientific and medical community. And then there was this huge study from the United States in which they screened over 10,000 people with a CT scan and they came up that the coronary artery calcification score is a better predictor than the whole framing and risk score for asymptomatic uh, individuals. So calcification matters. So that is something that we changed over the years. Now, how does vitamin K work? Vitamin K is a fat-soluble vitamin. It's a vitamin, vital amine. Given 100 years back, we need to ingest it because our body cannot make it. So we take it via the food. It's absorbed, and then vitamin K goes via the bloodstream into the organs, into the cells, to the endoplasmic reticulum, where the vitamin K-dependent pro uh, proteins are post-transnationally activated, and vitamin K becomes reduced. The reduced form of vitamin K is the active cofactor, and by oxidizing vitamin K, you drive the energy, you provide the energy to introduce an extra carboxyl group into a glutamate amino acid. This gives the protein an extra negative charge. Via this extra negative charge, it can bind to calcium phosphate crystals, thereby blocking the nucleation and further growth of these crystals. Makes sense. Why do you need micrograms of vitamin K and not milligrams of vitamin K, like, for example, with vitamin C or E? Because vitamin K is recycled. One molecule of vitamin K can create thousands of these reactions. Now, what happens if we use vitamin K antagonists? Most of you know that vitamin K antagonists is a blood thinning medication. If you have hypercoagulability, you give vitamin K antagonists. You block the function of vitamin K. That's the word antagonist saying. And it antagonizes the recycling of vitamin K. So one molecule of vitamin K can then only create one GLA residue. So you create a vitamin K deficiency. Now, this vitamin K antagonist treatment was for us very important because that was the way to communicate to cardiologists and hematologists and internal medicine doctors that vitamin K metabolism is important. So when we give this vitamin K antagonist, warfarin in this case to animals, in this case to rats, for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, or five weeks, we see that within two weeks, of treatment of a vitamin K antagonist, antagonizing the function of vitamin K, you end up with calcifications in the vasculature along the elastic lamina. This leads to vascular stiffening and to vascular remodeling. And actually, it was the uncarboxylated, inactive form of MGP that was present at these sites of calcification. So what is vitamin K deficiency? How do, the, do you define vitamin K deficiency? You have clinical manifestations, for example, an acute bleeding disorder, then you can have a vitamin K deficiency. For example, if you have too much vitamin K antagonist in your, in your body, then you end up with bleedings, and then you have to take high dose of vitamin K. But we believe that there is also a chronic vitamin K deficiency, and that leads to bone demineralization and vascular calcification. 
The question is, how do you measure that? Well, during our quest for, for the answers for vitamin K and the relation to vascular health and, and, and healthy aging, we came up with the production of antibodies, specific tools recognizing the active form of MGP and the inactive form of MGP. The active form of MGP is produced with the presence of vitamin K. The inactive form of MGP is produced in the absence of vitamin K. Now, what you can see is that If you have a good vitamin K status, actually the survival rate in patients is very good. If you have a poor vitamin K status and you have a high DPUC MGP, then you see that your survival is very bad. With other words, if you measure vitamin K status with our biomarker, then you can predict how the survival rate of these patients is better take your vitamin K supplements to activate your MGP. The nice thing is, is what we also showed in this study is that patients were treated with vitamin K antagonists by medical doctors to improve, let's say, their, their, their um, health uh, benefits. However, what we did see is that if you gave these patients vitamin K antagonists, worsening the vitamin K status and vitamin K deficiency, they had more chance of dying. With other words, vitamin K deficiency is really important. And then we have uh, several uh, Dutch studies. The first one we were involved with with our Maastricht University. The others were independent studies in which they checked, in which the researchers investigated the intake of vitamin K via food, K1, MK, MK7, MK4, so K2. And what they showed is that K1 had no effect on the vascular health. But that vitamin K2, menaquinones, especially the long-chain menaquinones, were associated with a reduced risk on coronary artery disease in the Rotterdam study. That high dietary intake was associated with less coronary artery calcification in women. And that high menaquinone intake reduced it reduced the incidence of coronary artery disease in women, and that was done in 16,000 elderly women, which were postmenopausal. So it seems that if you have a healthy intake via the food of your vitamin K2, that you're more protected and that your vascular st system stays healthy. Now, how to treat vitamin K deficiency and how to treat vascular calcification? So far, there is no pharmaceutical treatment for vascular calcification. So what should we eat to get sufficient vitamin K, K2? So we could think of, for example, eating every day one kilogram of sauerkraut. Well, I think that would be a challenge. We could eat 400 grams of cheese, but it also comes with a lot of saturated fat. So maybe we could choose natto. It's a fermented soybean. It's a rotten soybean. It looks like a rotten soybean, and it tastes like a rotten soybean. I can tell you from own experience. We can also eat our own features as our uh, primates do when you go to the zoo or if you look at rats, they eat their own features. Why would they do it? It's full of nutrients. It's full of vitamin K2. So it's healthy. Would I recommend it? No. So maybe better just take a pill or capsule and supplement patients or people that are vitamin K deficient. So when we checked this, giving higher doses of vitamin K, we wanted to see if there are models, and this is an animal model in collaboration with the, um, with the clinicum in Aachen, Germany, where we fed animals, mice in this case, with either warfarin together with K1, and on top of that, we supplemented K2. And what you can see is that if we added K2, to the K1 and warfarin, we could completely rescue the calcification phenotype. So K2 entered also the vasculature, activated their MGP, prevented mineralization of the vasculature. And there was a huge inhibition of vascular calcification simply by giving extra vitamin K2 to the diet. Now, it's nice if you can rescue these animals, but you want to rescue and you want to save and help patients. So this is the first study that we conducted, and this was done on vitamin K1, very high dose. It was 15 milligrams per day, 
uh, sorry, per week, 15 milligrams per week, so two milligrams of K1 per day. One year of treatment, patients with aortic valve calcification. We gave placebo versus vitamin K for one year, and we measured MGP. And what you can see from this graph is that there is a huge reduction in the inactive form of MGP. So we were able to activate MGP. So the treatment worked. Now, what about the progression of vascular calcification? We saw that in the placebo group, there was a progression of calcification of 50%, whereas in the vitamin K-treated group, there was a progression only of 25%. So there was 50% less progression of calcification. Now, you can say, okay, this is not much, but it's a start. It's a one-year trial only. It is with K1, in this case, high doses. We didn't found the optimal treatment yet. And I have to say, this was an underpowered study. It was two times 35 patients. So we need larger numbers to really find the answer. Today, we have two tr studies still uh, up and running. One is the vita cuck study. We are at this moment analyzing. And the second one is the vita vasc study. And that was presented two years ago already as an abstract to the American Society of Nephrology. And in that study, which again became underpowered because we, we had to uh, um, stop the trial, but again, vitamin K1 showed a beneficial effect in inhibiting the progression of vascular calcification. Now, I was also asked to talk a little bit our new research. What are we doing? So we investigate vitamin K research in relation to vitamin K-dependent proteins and vascular calcification. But the system of vitamin K metabolism is way more ancient than the vitamin K-dependent proteins. If you look at plants, they have vitamin K1. There is not one single vitamin K-dependent protein in plants. Why would a plant have vitamin K cycle? Why do bacteria have this vitamin K cycle? That is because the cycle is a redox system, reduction oxidation. So what it does, it scavenges free radicals, and it transports electrons in the respiratory chain, supporting ATP synthesis, energy production. So what you can tell from this, and we published this concept uh, three years ago in uh, ATVB, that we have vitamin K as a scavenger of free radicals in the cell. So what are these non-canonical functions? So we tested this on vascular smooth muscle cells where we treated vascular smooth muscle cells with warfarin, this vitamin K antagonist. You block the recycling, and what you can see from a dose of 25 micromolars of warfarin to vascular smooth muscle cells, you see a steep and significant increase in um, oxidative stress, intracellular oxidative stress. What you can also see is that if you give together with the warfarin also MK7, you can completely rescue that. So the production of oxidative stress is based on vitamin K metabolism. So MK7 can prevent warfarin-induced oxidative stress. We have more studies in which we also show that nicotine, one of the com components of smoking, also introduces intracellular oxidative stress in the vasculature, which was completely prevented when giving vitamin K2. So vitamin K2 is a very potent scavenger of free radicals, preventing DNA damage, protein damage, and lipid damage. So this is an area of research that we are currently investigating. So summarizing all this information, what did I say? We have at the right corner, we have the carboxylase-dependent role of vitamin K. Vitamin K activates a glue into a glass, so an active vitamin K-dependent protein. By this, you can inhibit vascular calcification. But we also see that vitamin K has antioxidant work. So it prevents oxidative stress. It actually is linked to NQ01, which is one of the vitamin K-dependent enzymes that is under the control of NRF2, what, one of the master transcription regulator of antioxidant function in a cell. So we believe that vitamin K2 has more functions than only being a cofactor. And I think this is only the tip of the iceberg, and I hope that in a few years we can present way more data that vitamin K is a nutrient that we have to take for healthy aging. So, 
Thanks also to all the sponsors that made my work possible and to my group. Actually, these are the people that do all the hard work. I just have simply uh, put it together and presented. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, looking at our timing, because we um, do uh, produce this online and we record this as well, we're kind of out of time. But that doesn't mean we're out of time, really, for questions from the audience. So I do want to open that up for comments and questions from our audience. And that was, that was rich. Thank you. Um, Mark Muller, um, Kaivedi Consulting. That was delightful. I really enjoyed it. Um, given one of your early slides saying that we really don't have a recommended daily intake for K2, um, and given the implications that you've, you've proposed, do you not think that, one, we need a, a recommended daily intake, and also on our annual physical exams, we should be using, uh, even if it's indirect, um, like blood measures for the uh, uncalcified uh, proteins, yeah. that that should be part of our routine moving forward. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. So I was on the panel of the uh, of the FDA in 1999 when we we created, let's say, a, a, a new RDI for vitamin K, and this is solely based on vitamin K1 on the data that are present on K1. It's solely based on blood coagulation. So how much vitamin K do we need to support proper coagulation? Not that we have bleeding tendencies. For the rest, there is nothing that is taken into account. And I would really advocate that we should look into these extrahepatic functions of vitamin K and also come up with new RDIs, also for proper healthy aging or normative aging, as people call it, and that we need higher intakes, for sure, because the liver is quite selfish. It takes what it needs. Eh? It, 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 it has to have it because of the proper coagulation. It doesn't make sense if we would bleed to death but have strong bones. But then there is a redistribution to extrahepatic tissues, and I think we need higher intakes. Just a quick follow-up question. Yep. Totally different. So you have proposed that some of the mysteries of K2 may be revealed through different mechanisms like free radical scavenging yeah. and uh, therefore perhaps limiting chronic inflammation through, through transcription factors. Do you think that you, the synergy that uh, you, you would, let me pose it differently, would you expect synergy with other excellent inhibitors of um, NF-kappa B or stimulants or NRF2 or other free radical yeah. scavengers? in a combination, would, that, uh, would you expect that to have better anti-inflammatory yeah. properties? If we look at the human body, we are pretty complex. And I don't think and don't believe that one single nutrient can do it all. So I think and I believe in the synergy of combining products, preferentially person-specific. So who needs what? And I think for that, we need actually te good tests, biomarkers, to really find out which, pe which person, which patient needs which kind of combination products. So yes, I believe in the combination of, of products. Thank you. Um, I, I want to just mention too that um, I regularly, well, semi-regularly, every five years I get a um, cardiac plaque scan. It's an electron scan uh, just to see what's going on in my blood vessels and my heart. and. Uh, Ten years ago, they did not ask about supplementation. And when I more recently went for another scan, not only did they ask about supplementation, dietary supplementation, but specifically they asked in the questions when going in for an appointment if you take vitamin K2. Of course, they didn't ask about specific form on that, but that was of interest to me. So I think that although there's not an RDI, um, certainly that's a, USD, uh, a United States factor, and there's others here in EU, um, it is, uh, K2 is being recognized in the healthcare professions, uh, the science behind K2 yeah. and its uh, benefits for cardiac health and plaque. That's and I did want to ask you a question about that then, um, just uh, when we talk about laying on of um, a calcification of arterial walls, um, is there, are there other antagonists 
um, to K2 other than, or dietary, are there dietary antagonists? So you, you cited warfarin, of course, which is a, a pharmaceutical, but what about dietary antagonists, um, or are there known, um, are there things that people need to be aware uh -huh. of? That's a good question. Um, I'm not aware of other than pro-inflammatory um, cytokines, um, oxidized lipids, they all facilitate vascular calcification. Because you need a nidus, you need a starting point where the calcium phosphate can nucleate on. So calcium phosphate nucleation is just basic chemistry, but you need a biological surface where it can start. So everything that fulfills a kind of cellular apoptosis, which is not cleared efficiently, that will lead to mineralization. So I think if you, if you have something that creates a pro-inflammatory uh, um, um, environment, that you would also facilitate vascular calcification. But nothing as strong as the vitamin K antagonist treatment with warfarin. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of room for quite a bit of research. <laughs> I can see that. That'll keep you busy. Yeah. Um, so we're at the end of our uh, Life Stages Theater programming for today. I just want to um, ask everyone here if you have any other questions, yes, uh, before we close. I'll keep it short. Um, in one of your slides, you uh, showed that uh, um, it, it, when you have a K2 deficiency, um, you could solve that by eating your own digestion. Um, I was wondering, um, could it then not uh, similarly be considered as a deficiency of your microbiome or your intestinal wall for absorption of K K2? Because it, it is there. Yes. It's, it's a good question. So this is already studied from the, uh, from the early 90s, how much vitamin K is produced by the microbiome. And the issue is that the microbiome is mainly located in the, in the large intestine. The absorption takes place in the first part of the small intestine of fat-soluble compounds. So it's quite distinct. So there is a distance between that. And people do not really know about the true absorption of microbiome produced vitamin K2 and how much is, let's say, reaching the body. If you give patients or people a vitamin K deficient diet, within three days, you create a subclinical vitamin K deficiency, meaning that you really need to take it via the food. But we do not know yet if the vitamins that you take via the food also influence the health span of the microbiome. And this is also a very interesting topic of research. 